Mm-hmm. I am? Hey, I got the thumbs up. We are on. We are on live. We're having technical difficulties. I'll just leave it, babe. Just leave it. If it falls, it falls. Let the chips fall where they may, as Johnny Cash used to say. Uh, just going <clears> to <throat> talk a little bit. Uh, if you're on, share. Let people know we're on, get your friends, your neighbors, all that kind of good stuff. Get you a good cup of coffee, uh, maybe a little bit of a banana nut bread. I got some banana nut bread waiting on me. It's going to be good. And uh, <clears throat> so, you know, we're doing this at home, Amy and I, and uh, technology is not really our thing. So we're doing all this on a flip phone. So <clears throat> it's pretty amazing. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Uh, but just as everybody's getting on, I hope everybody's doing great. Hope everybody's having a good week. And, um, you know, I've been listening to the news. Maybe we're going to be opening up pretty soon. Who knows? And uh, if we do, we'll get to see each other. And, um, you know, hopefully that will go well. And I know some people are still nervous. Just remember that God is still on the throne. And he's got it all under control. And uh, he is our protector, our defender, our physician. And uh, so just keep that in mind. I heard some good news today. A uh, man of the church whose sister uh, had had uh, COVID-19 is now recovered and uh, has tested negative twice. So praise the Lord for that. And uh, so just keep everybody in prayer as, uh, as we keep going, keep moving. And, uh, you know, life goes on. And uh, we adjust and we adapt, and that's what we do. Uh, but through it all, we keep the joy, the joy of the Lord. That is our strength, right? Because we always know that God is able and he's on the throne and everything's going to be good. So <clears throat> I want to remind you about a couple of things. Remember, if your teenagers are sitting around in the house doing nothing, uh, get them on Zoom with Pastor Thomas. And uh, I know they'll enjoy that. Get to see each other's faces and all that good stuff. And um, don't forget, tomorrow at 3 on the Cross Kids Facebook page, Pastor Vanessa will be releasing another video for the kids. And, uh, and then, of course, Sunday we'll be together online again uh, <clears throat> on Facebook. And so, and also a lot of people don't have Facebook. So if you don't know, we are putting it on to uh, YouTube. Uh, it's on YouTube uh, by 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. So if people don't have Facebook, they can watch it there. And so if you'll help spread the word there, that would be fantastic. And, uh, <clears throat> and then something I was telling uh, people today um, I think that all this has radically changed our society and the way we do church. And I think some things will get back to normal, uh, but I think normal is going to be different. And uh, what it's going to look like, I'm not sure. But I do believe that a lot of people have gotten connected to church online. And, uh, and I think that's going to be a very big evangelistic tool of the church, uh, bigger than it's been. Uh, there's people that were never really into technology uh, that have figured it out. Uh, we have people in our church that have gone out and got smartphones so that they can be connected to church and other people that have gotten a Facebook account for the first time uh, so they can be connected. And, uh, and so this is something that is going to be significant. And even uh, for people that are homebound, I think it's going to be significant. And so I am... Uh, determined that we're going to try to have a very high quality online service uh, from this point on and uh, continue to make it look nice, to make it sound nice. I was sitting around with somebody just yesterday and they were saying they had noticed that um, there were people on our services but, but they don't go to our church and uh, they have another church and when they asked why they said, well, their online presence just doesn't keep their attention. You know, it's hard to keep attention because you're in a living room. You know, here I've got my, my two dogs over here that are not bothering me at all today. It's kind of different. <clears throat> and uh, But there's all kinds of stuff going on. And if you're on Facebook, you're getting all kinds of things on Facebook and your phone's dinging and going off and all that kind of stuff. So uh, to keep people's uh, attention online is uh, is even more difficult than being in in the sanctuary itself when we're all together so we want to do very good at that and try to use this as an evangelistic tool and um, 
you know, we want to do all we can to help people find Christ and to find the life that he has for them and to find eternal life. And uh, so uh, <clears throat> just want to make sure that you know that. And uh, so you may see some changes in how we do things visually and uh, how we do things with sound, that kind of stuff, as we try to figure all that out. Um, hopefully people are getting on. Is everybody on? Or is mm -hmm. it just me and you? Yeah. No, thanks. Okay. So, hey, if you're on, go ahead and, and share it with people. And uh, I'd love to have about 25, 30 shares tonight. That'd be fantastic. See if we can get some other people on. I'm going to be talking about forgiveness today. We finished Hope last week. All those are on the YouTube channel. And, uh, and so... If, uh, if you missed any of them, you can go there and, uh, and watch them there. Uh, if you have questions over, over any of those after you watch them, you can always just email me or call me or text me or whatever to say, hey, hey. And uh, <clears throat> so that'd be good. Okay, but tonight I'm going to start on forgiveness. And I sent a text message out to a lot of people just reminding them, trying to get it out to the whole church. But I'm sure I may have missed some trying to use my phone, my flip phone, you know. Not really. It's not a flip phone. Okay, it's an iPhone, but I don't want anybody to know that, so don't tell anybody. I want, I'm, I'm an Android guy forced to use an iPhone. Okay? Just so you know. Anyway, what was I saying? Do you remember? You're saying it's quieter than normal. Maybe your volume. No, I'm, well, it's not your volume, but maybe you should turn it down. I'm you know quieter than... Hmm? It's quieter than normal? That's what this says. Hmm. I wonder what that means. <clears throat> Do I need to be louder? That what needs to happen? I don't know. Wait, wait, I'll, I'll speak a little bit louder, but I'm going to talk about forgiveness, and I sent a text message uh, to let people know what I was going to be doing, and uh, and I got back a message from uh, a lady in the church who, you know, sent me a pretty long text message about how difficult forgiveness is and how hard it is when you've been hurt by somebody that you love, and uh, and that's very true. Very, very true. And uh, forgiveness is something that's very difficult to, to work through. So that's what I'm going to be talking about for the next three or four weeks. And um, if we end up meeting together, um, I'll probably finish this online. I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. Who knows what I'm going to do. Uh, but I will finish this one way or the other. But I, I hope that you'll tune in and share with people. And I think this is something that's very, very uh, important. A lot of people carry around a lot of bitterness and a lot of unforgiveness, a lot of anger, a lot of hurt, a lot of pain, and, uh, and we need to work through that. So, uh, so I'm going to get into that, uh, but let's have a word of prayer first, okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and this time together. Lord, I ask that you would guide and direct us in, uh, in all that we do. And as we get into your word, Lord, I pray that you would uh, help us illuminate your truth and uh, help us to know what you want us to know. Lord, I pray that you would not allow anything that's of me to pass through, but only what is of your Holy Spirit. We give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said together, Amen. I thought you were going to say it for a minute. I was nervous. I was like, man, I'm right here in my own house. Sorry. It's distracting. I'm watching the comments. I'm listening to you. And, You're you know, distracted? I'm multitasking. You're distracted looking at me? No, I'm, dist I'm distracted because I'm pulling That's right. Different. She's distracted looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay. <clears throat> so, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18. And I'm actually going to cover a lot. I'm going to cover a lot. And, uh, and so, uh, as you're turning there and as we're getting into this, maybe some of you put in the comments area if you if uh, you know your experience with forgiveness, if you've had a hard time forgiving somebody, uh, what it's taken, maybe if somebody you've had to ask somebody for <laughs> forgiveness, um, just kind of share so we can have some uh, discussion there. And uh, and again, if you have any questions or if you have comments or anything like that, please put them in there. And <clears throat> my lovely assistant uh, will help me know something's going on over there. You can't see her, but she's over there and she'll start going. <laughs> That's not and true. And I just see that. Tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not true. She's just way at me. So anyway, <clears throat> we'll do that. So Matthew chapter 18. And so let's let's start reading there together. And I'm just going to go through this and, and, and pull out a few things kind of as an introduction as we get going on this subject of forgiveness, okay? Uh, are you laughing at me? Yeah, just like <laughs> do that. Okay. Please sure. <clears throat> what did you say? I do it like this, and then you pull the shirt. 
I need to pull my shirt? Yeah. <laughs> You're okay. a wrinkle. A wrinkle? <laughs> it's just old names, man. Pushing 50. Hashtag pushing 50. All right, enough of that mess. Let's sorry. get serious about the word of oh, no, God. I'm sorry. Here. See, I'm distracted. <laughs> Okay, Matthew chapter 18, verse 1. Okay, it says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, in another gospel where it's talking about this, it actually says they begin to argue about it. And so I want you to get this picture. Uh, Jesus is the Messiah. They recognize him as the Messiah. They still see him in kind of the Jewish prophecy culture of the, of the day uh, that he's going to be a king and, and there's going to be He's going to, you know, bring forth all this power and dominate the Roman Empire. And, and, and so they begin to have this question, who's going to be the greatest? And this continues. Even right before Jesus goes into the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, the mother of James and John come to him and say, Hey, will you promise me one thing? Let them sit on the right and left hand of you on, on your throne. So this is a big deal. So there is an argument taking place, and they're arguing over who's going to be the greatest. And who's going to have the most power? Who's going to have the greatest position? And so um, we, we see here the sinful nature. And, and at, its, at its basic um, component, our selfish nature is egotistical and selfish. We, we put ourselves in the place of God. We, we try to, to be God to ourselves. We try to be God to other people. We exalt ourselves. To positions that we do not deserve, that we don't have merit for, uh, we're always wanting the very best, and then we're selfish, so we go after that. It's not just that I want it, but I go after it. So here, this isn't just something they hope for. This is something they went after. They argued about it. Uh, you know, I don't know how they were arguing about it. You know, one said, "I'm gonna be the greatest," and the other said, "No, I'm gonna be the greatest." And you know, I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, they had this argument, and then Jesus goes into this. Uh, this lesson and and we're going to find a lot of very familiar passages here but i want you to take note of the context the context is about disciples arguing over who's going to be the greatest and uh, who's going to have the best position the highest position in his kingdom and so what does he do the first thing he does in verse two there it says he called the little child to him and placed the child among them and he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. So he's talking about this lowly position. So you have conflict. And there is conflict in the church, there's conflict in the family, there's conflict in society. And, and we see that in the disciples arguing over who's going to be the highest one. And the first thing he does is says you need to take a lowly position like a child. And so now, <clears throat> children in our day have been exalted. We don't want to see them cry, we don't want to see them hurt, we don't want to see them suffer. But in those days, children were, were not highly valued at all until they became adults. And, of course, women were not highly valued back then either. Um, but <clears throat> when, when, when they were children, they were worthless. They, they, I mean, they weren't really worthless, but they were treated as if they were worthless. That's why when there's another time when the children were coming to Jesus and the disciples tried to shoo them away. And, uh, and Jesus said, don't stop them from coming to me because they are important. But in that society, in that culture, they, they were nothing. So when he says, be like a child, he's saying, you need to, to be... Um, you know, as, as if you are nothing. Remember the whole thing with hope, and we talked about humbling ourselves. We humble ourselves to a lowly position. And so conflict is solved and dealt with in a, in a godly way when we learn how to take a lowly position. So as we get into this forgiveness and everything, I want you to, I want it to kind of set straight in, in your mind there that forgiveness one of the requirements to forgive or one of the things you need to be able to do in order to forgive people well is take a lowly position. Uh, the scripture says in Philippians that Christ did not consider himself um, 
uh, did not consider the fact that he was equal with God something to be grasped or, or used to his advantage. In other words, he didn't walk around saying, I'm God and you better treat me that way. But whenever there has been hurt and somebody has betrayed us, the anger we feel, the hurt we feel, is because we feel like we've been disrespected, we feel like we have been put down, devalued, and, and our pride rises up, and, and we do not want that. It doesn't feel good. We don't like it. It's not right. And we immediately start thinking about, you've hurt me, you've, you've damaged me, you've caused pain in me, I want to feel better, and everything's about us, and so we become egotistical and selfish. And that is a natural response, uh, but it's not a godly response. And so a godly response is a lowly position where when they hurt us, our first thought is, how can we minister to them? Not how can they you know, make things right with us? And so that's that's one thing to, to be able to take a lowly position. So when we start talking about forgive, if you have a hard time forgiving somebody, there there is some, um, and I want to be careful how I say this because it's not really pride in the sense of puffing yourself up, <clears throat> but it is uh, egotistical in that we're putting ourselves in the place of God. Um, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to gain our own healing. Somebody has hurt us, and so we hold a grudge, or we get angry, or we give them the silent treatment to force them to do what we think will heal our hearts. And so we're trying to bring about our own healing by forcing them to change their behavior, whereas God would say, let them be who they are, forgive them, I will heal you, so that Christ becomes our healer. And so this, this lowly position is not trying to get somebody else to do something to make you feel better or to, to heal you, but go to God for your healing. And we're going to get into that as we go deeper. Because it's not easy to do. It's very difficult to do. But let God be your healer and let them go and release them of the offense. And, uh, and so <clears throat> a lowly position. And, uh, and so it takes humility to be able to forgive. And uh, so again, I don't mean humility as opposed to pride like I'm puffing myself up but humility into, uh, as opposed to this idea of, of trying to do for myself what really only God can do. You know, if somebody hurts you really badly and they come back and apologize, it doesn't remove the hurt. You still hurt, you know, and you don't automatically, you know, trust that person again. You're not automatically okay. You know, you appreciate what they've done, but it doesn't remove the pain. And only God can heal the pain. And, uh, and so I need to take that lowly position and let God be my healer and not try to get somebody to do something for me for my own healing. It doesn't work anyway. So anyway, I kind of rambled on a little bit about that. But let's keep going. So remember, they're arguing about who's the greatest. And he starts talking about how do you deal with conflict? How do you deal with conflict? Okay. And he says, first, you need to have a lowly position. Okay. So in, uh, in verse 6, he goes on, he says, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me. So now he's taking a child and comparing it to a believer. So anyone who causes a believer to stumble, okay? Now, what is the context here? The context is being selfish. It's, it's wanting a better position. It's conflict between two disciples. It's conflict between two believers. He's speaking to the disciples here. He's not speaking to the world. So he's talking about in the church, you know, that if you as a believer cause somebody else in the church, another believer to stumble, okay, uh, this is a big deal because they were arguing with one another. It was creating division. And that's what happens is, is even though we're Christians, we argue, we fight, we want what we want, we become selfish, we get egotistical, we hurt one another, and then we try to force one another to heal us by apologizing or doing something or whatever and uh, and, it, and it causes us to stumble and uh, and so he says if anyone causes one of these little ones those who believe in me to stumble it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea now that's pretty significant so you know I don't even know how to expound on that any better. He's saying if, if you cause another believer to stumble in their faith, 
it'd be better for you to have a, a stone tossed around your neck and thrown into the sea. Uh, verse 7, he says, Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. Okay? If your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. Now, we use this scripture a lot, and, and I'm going to go back to context a lot tonight. We use this scripture in verse 8 a lot. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. In other words, if something's causing you to sin. But I want you to see the context. The context in which Jesus uses this is conflict in the church. And so if something causes you to have conflict with another believer, it would be better for you to take that thing and cut it off than to hold on to it. And so you begin to see how significant this is. Uh, one of the reasons that it's such a big deal that there be unity in the church is because the church represents Christ. So when the church is infighting and fighting with one another and arguing with one another and they can't get along with one another, when you have Christian couples getting a divorce or when you have Christian families that are uh, full of hatred and bitterness toward one another, it gives God a bad name. It, it's not a good witness. It doesn't help spread the gospel. In fact, it hurts the gospel. And uh, people look at that and say, well, they're Christians and look what their family's like or look what their marriage is like. And so he, he's talking about this. If something causes you to sin, but it's in the context of offending one another and, uh, and causing someone else to stumble uh, because you're being selfish or, or whatever these arguments between you. So let's keep on going. He says... Um, if your hand or foot, I'm in verse 8, if your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands and two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. So let's talk about the, the analogies he's talking about. Your hand, okay, the things that you do. Okay, uh, so if somebody offends you, um, <clears throat> or, or, or if you do something to offend somebody, then you need to cut it off. So whatever you're doing, then you wanna you wanna stop doing it. Okay, now if it's causing them to let me rephrase that, not to offend them because people can get offended by anything. But if you're doing something that is hurting somebody's faith, mm -hmm. okay, then you wanna be careful about that thing. Uh, it says if your foot does it, so wherever you go, if you're going to places that are going to cause people to stumble. You know, I tell people all the time, if there, it's not a sin for me to drink a beer. If I want to have a glass, a glass of wine or whatever, there's no sin in that. But if, you, if, if, if I'm in a, a restaurant in public and somebody sees me sitting at the bar drinking beer, uh, it sends the wrong message. And so that's something that I would never do. And, uh, and so we have to be careful. We always want to... So what he's telling us here is the main thing is to keep unity in the church, unity in the family, unity be between believers by doing everything you can not to do something that hurts someone's faith. Okay? And I'll get a little bit deeper into that in a minute. Okay? And then he says, if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. Okay? Um, so, you know, you don't want to cause people to stumble. And, and so he's saying when there's conflict, be like a little child, be lowly. I mean, don't fight for your rights. Cause instead, act like you don't have any rights. But instead, uh, do everything you can what's best for them. And so it's a whole radical thing. The, the disciples are arguing over each one of them wants what's best for them. And he's saying... This is wrong. This is the wrong way to do it. You need to fight for what's best for the other person and quit trying to do things for yourself. And if you do things for yourself, if you're selfish, you're going to cause someone else to stumble. Okay? And then he goes into verse 10. Okay? He says, See that you do not despise uh, one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he, not, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go off to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep 
than about the 99 that did not wander off. And in the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of the little ones should perish. Okay, now we, we talked about this, you know, that he leaves the 99 and he goes after the one, but remember the context. Mm -hmm. It's if between believers, somebody mm -hmm. is selfish, causes the other person to stumble, and, and so they walk away, then he's saying, that he goes after the one who walked away, the one who, uh, whose faith was was hurt, the one that was that uh, suffered, and so now we're supposed to do that. So if somebody hurts me, um, then my mindset needs to be what's best for them, because then if I get angry with them, okay, then what happens is then I can offend them. And there's division, and they walk away. And so the whole thing here is Christ is, is teaching them, quit worrying about yourself and think about others first and love them first and figure out what's best for them. Okay? Now let's get into this in verse uh, 15. And he's still dealing with this conflict in the church. Okay? Is there any questions or comments? Just super quiet? No, we got nothing to say? Nothing at all? No. I'm not offended though. You must be explaining it very well. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I'm not stumbling in my face. That's no one's talking to me. You know, I'm okay. I'm okay. It's all right. Okay. Anyway, okay. Let's go to verse 15. So, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. So this this whole thing is if if somebody uh, hurts you. Go and talk to them, okay? Now, there are scriptures that say if a wise person overlooks an offense, or there are times when you just let it go, but there are times when you need to go and talk to them, but you talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, okay? Now, I want to take you back to Leviticus. Don't turn there, but Leviticus 19, 17, and you can just write that down. It says, do not hate a fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your, rebuke your neighbor frankly so you will not share in their guilt. So in other words, if if you cannot get past it without talking about it to that person, and you sense that bitterness and anger and hatred is setting inside of you, then you need to try to talk to that person. Okay? You need to try to talk to them just between you. Okay? And then it says, if they listen to you, you have won them over. So when you go and talk to them, the whole purpose is not for you to give what you need to be healed. Okay? So we want to go and talk to them, and we say, okay, I'm going to get them to apologize. I'm going to get to admit that they're right. I'm going to get to, you know, for them to, to, to see it my way. And, and that's very egotistical. We're trying to get them to do something to make us feel better, okay, as if they could heal us. They cannot heal you. Only God can heal you. And so the purpose here is to win them back into the fold. It's to destroy the discord. It's to regain unity in the church between believers, okay? So when somebody has hurt you, our, we have to take a lowly position, figure out what they need first, and then when we talk to them, the whole point is just to bring them back, to win them back over, not to get them to do anything for us, but to win them back, okay? And so again, it's about what they need, not about what we want, okay? Verse 16. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now, I'm going to say something about this. It's a little side note because we say this a lot, but look what he says. So that everything may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If something happened between you and a person and there were no other witnesses, you don't go and tell people what they did and then try to get those people to be on your side to go talk to them. Okay. Because they weren't witnesses. And then if you do that, your goal is not to win them over. You're trying to punish them, manipulate them, get them to do whatever you think you need to heal. And, uh, and that's, that's not what it's all about. Okay? Verse 17. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And, if they, and still, you've got to have witnesses. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or tax collector. Now... This is a significant lesson because we want everybody to like us. We want there to be love and peace between all of us. But the reality is it's not going to be that way. 
and not everybody's going to love you. And if somebody offends you and hurts you and betrays you and, uh, you know, does something horrible to you, you want the relationship to be reestablished, but that doesn't mean that it will be. And, and you need to have some wisdom that if they just refuse, then that's okay. As long as your goal is to win them back. Now, if your goal is to get them to do something for you so you feel better, then you're not having the right spirit about it. But if your goal is to just try to win them back and just try to restore the relationship and they don't want it, then that's okay. Um, you, don't, you don't have to be loved by everybody. Jesus was not loved by everybody. Uh, a lot of people hate him, still do. And so that's okay. The key is you want to make sure that you're doing your part. Okay? So he says, um, truly, I'm at verse 18 now. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now this is a very significant as well because we use this a lot for anything, you know, and, and it does say whatever. And so I think it, it can apply in a very broad sense. But I want you to pay attention again to Jesus' context. His context is how do you deal with conflict? How do you deal with people when they hurt you? Um, how do you deal with things when you've hurt somebody else? And, he, and he's saying, uh, you need to win them over, okay? If you can't win them over, then you're just okay with that. And, and they're just, they're not gonna be your close friend anymore. They're not gonna love you and that's okay. And, uh, and so, and he says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now he's talking about this in the context of relationships. And he's saying, so if somebody, if you're trying to reestablish the relationship and somebody just refuses, then for you to, to just put up a barrier and bind them from being intimate with you as a friend, then if you're in the right spirit, then heaven's going to back you up, okay? If you're not in the right spirit, then it's not going to be that way. And in the same way, if, if they are forgiven, okay, then they are reestablished, okay? And so he's trying to say we need to operate in the spirit of heaven. And in heaven, you have Christ who was the ultimate sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins while we were still sinning against him. And so there's ultimate forgiveness there. And so we need to be in the right spirit so that heaven is working in us and through us and, and to others around us, if that makes sense, okay? And so then he says in verse 19, again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything to ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. So now he's talking about the importance of it. So. You got the disciples arguing, I want this, I want this, I'm going to be the best, no, I'm going to be the best, and I'm going to have the best position, and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and Jesus immediately, he didn't talk about who's greater. He goes into, how do you deal with conflict? You have to become like a little child. You have to take a lowly position. And, and then you have to consider other needs first. And then you need to go after those that have, that have you know, that you, you know, that, that have gotten offended and, and, their, their faith has, has stumbled. And we go after them. We don't sit there and say, well, what's best for me? We say, well, what's best for them? I'm going to go after them. And, uh, and then he gets into this whole thing about, you know, talk to them about it, you know, but the whole purpose is to reestablish their relationship. So everything is about discord and unity, discord and unity. So when we're talking about forgiveness, one of the essential reasons for forgiveness that, that we need to understand is for unity, okay, unity. Uh, because what does it say right there? If you agree in his name, uh, then whatever we ask, it will be done. And he is here with us. When we are in discord and we can't agree on things and when we don't like each other and when we don't talk to each other and when, you know, we have enemies that are, that are in the church and we're allowing a grudge to stay in our own heart, then it's hard to be in the presence of God. It's hard for God to work in that relationship. It's hard for God to work in that heart. Okay, and so all, all of this is about, so he, he's laying down a, a foundation of why forgiveness is important, okay? Why is it important? Because if there's discord, then there's no power. If there's discord, then, then God's favor is hindered. God's grace is hindered. God's work is hindered, okay? 
because as long as I'm angry, as long as I'm offended, and all I can think about is what I want, what I need from that person, then I'm in a selfish mode. And so my heart's not right. The prayers that I have are coming out of the wrong spirit. They're, it's just messing me up all the way around, and it's creating discord. And what he wants is for the church, and I don't mean Crossroads Community Church or a particular building, but for the believers of this world to be unified, loving one another, forgiving one another, so that we are a good uh, picture of who Christ is, the one who forgives, you see. Um, it's very hard for the world to see a forgiving God when Christians don't forgive themselves and forgive each other. And so that's that's a very important thing. So then, after after this, it says, then, I'm at verse 21, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times. So remember, he, he went right into this whole thing of, of being betrayed and, and uh, discord and and, uh, and Peter understands that, and he says, well, how many times? How often shall I forgive? Now, the religious law at that time, the Pharisees had come up with a rule uh, that if somebody uh, offends you, if somebody, uh, you know, hurts you, then you have to forgive them three times, okay? And so Peter comes around, and Peter's trying to say, look how good I am. Uh, I'm saying seven times thinking he's doing much better. And of course, that was better than the Pharisees. Uh, but then Jesus answered in verse 22, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times, or in one translation, 70 times seven. And the word seven is symbolic. It means forever, always. And, uh, and let, me, let me give you a scripture out of Luke 17, verses four through six, and kind of the, the same place here, or the same situation. Uh, Jesus said, even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, then you must forgive them. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to the mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. And so again, that's another familiar scripture. You know, the faith of a mustard seed will move mountains. And it's true, but look at the context. The context is God gives you the power to forgive. Okay, and if somebody sins against you seven times a day and asks for forgiveness, you must forgive them. Okay, uh, the word forgive, uh, in you know the the basic component of the word for means ahead of time. Like when you're playing golf and you hit the ball in front of somebody and you go four. You know, it's not the number four. It's F O R E. In other words, something's coming up ahead. So to forgive means that I have the mindset of giving grace before they do something to me. And so that's the spirit of forgiveness. And, uh, and so he's saying here that this faith, this massive amount of faith, is to help you move mountains. And what is the mountain? The mountain is your own bitterness, your own hurt, your own pain. And it says the faith of a mustard seed. So it just takes a little bit of faith that is growing. Okay, a little bit of faith that is growing. And so, then Jesus goes into this uh, parable, and I'm going to read this parable, and then I'm going to stop and see if there's any questions or comments or anything like that. Um, in verse 22, it says, Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man owed him ten thousand bags of gold. A man, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins, so much, much less. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you have, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into the prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. 
should you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So, again, the context of all this is when there's conflict between believers and somebody has sinned against somebody else, then there needs to be forgiveness. In order for there to be forgiveness, we have to have a lowly position and we have to consider what other people need in order to bring them back into the fold, uh, not what do I need to feel better? Okay, that's a big, a big point. But then he's going into, and he's talking about if if you don't do this and there's discord, then you're not operating uh, from heaven. He's saying whatever's loosed on earth is loosed. So in other words, this power from heaven is slowing down. Okay, it's slowing down. And when you don't do that, then the power is broken. And then he goes into this parable where. Uh, of course, he represents the first master who forgave, and then we are the other ones, and we don't forgive our brother and sister. And, and what he's saying is what we have been given, we should now give because it flows. And so forgiveness is, is a form of love. Forgiveness is grace. Forgiveness is giving people uh, favor when they don't deserve it. It is letting things go, releasing them from the sin. And... Um, and next week we'll get into atonement and, and all that that means and the blood sacrifice and how that affects me and who I am. Um, but here what he's trying to say is it flows, okay? And it's not that the God doesn't want to forgive you, uh, but what it is is we stop the grace, okay? We stop the grace. Forgiveness covers my sin, which allows me to receive all the favor of God. And, and, and remember, they're arguing. They want to know who's going to be the top, who's going to be the, the, the highest position. They're wanting to know who's going to receive the most grace, who's going to receive the most benefit. And, and they're going about it in a selfish way. And what he's trying to say is that if you want to receive from God, then you've got to totally switch your mindset. And instead of trying to get what you need to feel better, you need to try to learn how to forgive and let things go so that there can be unity between each other. Uh, a lot of times in, in marriage counseling, I will try to explain to, to the couple that it, it requires supernatural power to get along in marriage and to get along in relationships. Uh, because especially between men and women, because we were designed so differently and, uh, and it can create a lot of, easily create discord, tension, frustration, all that kind of stuff. And when we argue from a selfish point of view, just trying to get what we need from the other person or what we want, then we're basically enabling the discord, which is cutting off our unity with the spirit in that moment. And I say it, it's almost as if you, you were telling the Holy Spirit, you can leave now, I'll deal with it because your, your, your anger and, and everything has escalated so much and there's not forgiveness. Now, all of this is, is extremely difficult to do. Um, I don't want to be light about it. It's hard. I don't do it all the time. You know, I don't, um, it's, it's very hard not to be hurt. It's very hard not to want that person to make things right. Um, but what he's trying to do is he's trying to show the disciples here the best life comes from forgiving, not from holding a grudge. And the greatest benefit from God comes when we forgive, not when we hold things against one another. And because it flows. And so as it flows out of me, then it flows into me. And as I give it away to other people, then God gives me more. So as I give grace, he gives me more grace. And as I give more grace, he gives me even more grace and as I give that grace then he gives me exponential grace and, uh, and grace is not just forgiveness grace is unmerited favor as God is working on my behalf more and more as I learn how to forgive and um, and so it's very very difficult um, what I'm going to get into in the next few weeks is you know how do you deal with it when you do lose your temper how do you deal with it when you can't forgive uh, some of the reasons that you can't forgive 
and, uh, and, and I kind of touched on that a little bit. A lot of it has to do with hurt, and, we, and we're craving something from that person to make us feel better, uh, to heal us. And we just have to resign ourselves that no person can heal our heart. Only God can do that. And so we have to let that go. And, uh, and But what, he, what, what he's doing, and the reason I started here, is because this is a motivation to forgive. It's not just a command to forgive. It's a motivation to say, as you forgive, you will receive more from me. That's what God is saying right here. So you don't have to fight who's going to be the best or the highest or anything like that. If, if you let the forgiveness flow, then you'll receive more grace. And, uh, and that's, that's the key to, uh, to you know, the best life. I have a question. Uh, Deborah Oligoff says, uh, people always say I forgive them, but I don't talk to them anymore or want them in my life. Is that considered real forgiveness? Is that considered what? Real forgiveness. Okay. Um, so she's asking there, she says, I forgive you to people, but then she doesn't talk to them or doesn't want them in their house. And, uh, and so there are there are a lot of nuances here because remember I talked about the, the scripture she says doesn't want them in her, her life, not she doesn't house. want them in her life I'm sorry not her house uh, but that would be included <laughs> <laughs> um, I totally understand that I completely understand that and I think that everybody watching would totally understand that as well anybody that's been deeply hurt would understand that and what we have to remember is that there are times right here that we just read if somebody uh, sins against you, go and talk to them. Uh, in Leviticus, uh, or I think it was Leviticus, I read that to you, and it says, rebuke them frankly. In other words, have a frank discussion about it so that hatred doesn't sin in within you. Okay, um, But the goal is to reestablish uh, the relationship. Now here's the key to this, this passage right here. Because he said, if you talk to them and they refuse, then you dismiss them. Okay? And, and the church saying, so you, you kick them out of the church, you treat them like a tax collector, you treat them like a pagan, as if they're not part of the church. Now, do we hate tax collectors or pagans? No, Jesus went after them. Okay? And so, but now you go after them uh, with less expectation because they're not a believer. He's saying, don't, don't. If, if they can't do this, then don't assume that they're right with God, but instead treat them as if they're not. Uh, but we still go after them and love them, but we do it differently. And so it changes. So if somebody, um, if, if we try to, to, to make it right and they refuse, and then and we accept that and say, okay, well, they refuse. There's nothing else I can do. And, and it's their choice not to come to our life. It's their choice not to talk to us, and it's their choice to do all that. Uh, that's okay, and there's nothing wrong with that. That doesn't mean you haven't forgiven them. Now, in the same way, the level of hurt makes a difference as well, because when you, um, the Bible says, do not cast your pearls before swine. Okay, in other words, don't give the best part of yourself to somebody who's going to trample on you all the time, and so. Without knowing the details of this question, if if somebody hurts you and you forgive them and they hurt you and you forgive them and you hurt, okay, I can forgive and forgive and forgive, but at the same time, I am no. There comes a time when I'm no longer loving them by continually laying myself before them to let them stomp all over me. There comes a time when love is drawing a line, saying, "I can't let you this far because." You keep hurting me, and so now to love you, I need to I need to put up a boundary, and I, and I talk a lot about it, talking about loving from a distance. So it's hard to answer that question. So I'm, I'm trying to talk about both. If they refuse, then that doesn't mean you haven't forgiven. But if you if you forgive, but they continually hurt you over and over and over and over again, there is a time that I believe the Holy Spirit will allow you to realize I need to put up a boundary. Now the way you will know is that if the boundary is full of hatred or hurt uh, and you can't let the hurt go and you're not healed, then it could be that that's you putting up the boundary and, and God would want you to go further. At the same time, if, um, if you're able to put up the boundary but you don't have hatred in your heart for that person, 
because they've hurt you over and over again, then then it could certainly be it's forgiveness, but they don't need to be back in your life. You know, if uh, if a if if a man you know comes to my house, a salesperson, my wife opens the door and he beats the tar out of her. Okay, well God would want me to forgive him, uh, but at the same time it would not be loving of me to bring you back into my house until I know that he's not going to do the same thing. That doesn't mean I couldn't go to his house. It doesn't mean I couldn't reach out to him and still keep him in my life, but I'm going to have some kind of barrier. So when he says, treat them like pagans or tax collectors, sometimes we read that and think, well, I can just dismiss them. No, Jesus went after tax collectors and pagans, but he did it without expectation, and he did it in a different way. You know, he didn't bring pagans and tax collectors into the Garden of Gethsemane. He brought his own disciples and he brought Peter, James, and John even closer to him uh, because he had boundaries. There were certain boundaries, if that makes sense. Um, but forgiveness is also a an action. So in other words, I could, in this particular question, I could, I could make myself call people, make myself love them in action and in word but on the inside still be hurt being hurt doesn't mean i haven't forgiven them okay being hurt just means that i'm still hurt okay forgiveness is how i treat them and so he says you need to forgive from your heart but remember jesus has to heal my heart and so the first thing that has to happen is i i need to love them and as i love them then god will heal my heart um but if I wait until my heart doesn't hurt to start loving them, it's never going to happen. Because, again, as I give forgiveness in my actions, then God heals my heart. And if I don't give, and if I don't love them in my actions, then I, I stop the flow, and so my heart is not healed, and I just stay in hurt. And so um, a lot of people say, well, I haven't forgiven them because I'm still angry. Well, you can be angry and not sin. Okay, and that's what I'm talking about. So you go after them. You go after the one. You go after the pagan. You go after the tax, tax collector. You love the sinner, uh, but you love with boundaries if necessary. And as you do that, then God heals your heart. But don't think just because you're angry you haven't forgiven. Um, and I know that's a very long question, but there's a lot in that. I mean, that's a very long answer, but that's a lot in that question. Is there any others? Or? She said, um, thank you, no, the boundary was put up in love. Okay, there you go. That's good. Um, the boundary was put up in love. Sue Klegner says seems harder when the person is gone, gone, but God is working it out. Yeah, if if the person who hurts you is suddenly gone, you know whether it's, you know, if a, if a, a stranger does something to you and you never talk to them again and they're gone, it it is harder. Or if somebody passes away, it's harder. Uh, but again, it goes back to the same thing. It's, it's because we're wanting that person to do something to make us feel better. But like Susan said, God has to work it out. We take it back to him, and, and he brings healing. That's good. Any other thoughts, comments? Yeah. That's it? Mm -hmm. Is there anybody else watching besides me, Deborah, and Susan, and me? <laughs> yeah, there's okay. 21. Okay, just okay. checking. <laughs> All right. Well, we're just kind of getting into it. I wanted to kind of lay this down as a, as a motivation. Um, well, it... What we talked about today doesn't, we kind of delved into it a little bit, but we really didn't get into what does it take to actually forgive somebody and, uh, and what that looks like. We talked about it a little bit, but we'll go deeper in the next few, week, few weeks. Uh, today was really just showing Christ, laying down a foundation of why forgiveness is, is necessary and why it is good. Because if we don't forgive, it's not just that we're not forgiven, it's that we block the grace and the presence of God in our own life, which hurts us and hinders us. Did you say something? Yeah, no, I was just agreeing. Yeah, Can I get an the amen result. over there? Yep. You know, Can I get amen. an amen? Yep. No, yep. that's a yep. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Amen. Okay, that's good. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I kept you. I kept you. It's about an hour, or so uh, I want to remind you tomorrow night. Uh, Zach will be doing uh, worship at seven, so you can tune in there. And, uh, and I just want to encourage you, keep your eyes toward the future. Don't get stuck in what's happening today. Always be looking forward. 
find a goal, what is God calling you to, what does God want you to accomplish, you know, set goals, move forward, and, uh, and, and remember, take the kingdom by force, don't shrink back, and, uh, and don't, don't get stuck in where you are at today, whatever season you're in, you'll get through it, God's going to get you through it, just keep holding on and wait, uh, but when you get through it, make sure you have a vision of where you're going and what you want, what God wants you to do. And uh, in everything, remember that we are called to love people into a loving relationship with Jesus Christ. And right. Heidi Wilkinson says, Four! Four! <laughs> Four! <laughs> now the dogs are going crazy. Four! That's funny. Uh, hey, God bless you all. Thank you. And uh, if I can do anything for you, text me, email me, call me, whatever. You can even come by my house. Okay, mask or no mask, all right? God bless you guys. Um, Joy says, Wednesday nights are the highlight of my week. Interactive Bible study while getting to be curled up on a couch with blankets. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, Joy. And then That's uh, good. Nikki says, keep a pep in your step. Get you Jesus juice. I'll have you on cloud nine. <laughs> there you go. That's good. Keep a pep in your step with some Jesus juice. <laughs> And that's love. That's what that is. Yeah. All right. God bless you guys. Thank y'all. I'm going to smile until Amy hits the button. Bye.